Isaiah chapter 30. We're going to read the opening verses of the 30th chapter. If time permitted, we would read the whole chapter and indeed into the first verse of chapter 31. But we read the opening verses of chapter 30. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be in help nor profit, but ashamed and also a reproach. The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon their shoulders, upon the shoulders of young asses, and their treasures upon the bunches of camels, to a people that shall not profit. For the Egyptians shall help in vain, and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. I'll not get into this this morning. Actually, that little text, which has become a favorite of preachers as a topical text for many reasons, their strength is to sit still. The quietists like that. The pietists like that. And many a preacher have I heard refer to this. Uh, there's a great deal of discussion about it and actually most commentators have come to the conclusion that actually, this is a, a reference to Egypt itself the word Rahab which is a, a name for Egypt in the Old Testament is actually here and uh, it seems to be more that uh, the blusterer will do no more than bluster the blusterer will simply sit still and do nothing and this is in the context, you're looking to Egypt for help, and she talks a lot. But like a whole lot of people who talk well, they don't do much to back up the talk. But that's uh, by the way. Verse 8, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not, or unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perver uh, perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shared to take fire from the hearth, or to take water with all out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. We finish in verse 15. The Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his precious word for his name's sake. This morning I want to take as our text the first verse of the following chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 31 verse 1. 
which is really the culmination of the argument that uh, commences in verse, uh, chapter 30, verse 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses, and trust in chariots, because they are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. The nation of Judah was under serious threat. The armies of Assyria were already on the march throughout the ancient world and no one was able to withstand them. They had long since turned their voracious eyes upon Judah and had subdued it. But Hezekiah the king had risen in revolt against Syrian domination and had broken the yoke of bondage. Now it was just a matter of time before Syria re or Assyria reinvaded Judah. It was just a matter of time before Sennacherib's armies would again be seen in the land doing all their deadly work. Indeed, they were on the march. And when we get over a few chapters, we find they are already in the land and have taken most of the land under their control. Now, the imminence of this danger raised an important and urgent question in Judah. What shall we do? We have risen in revolt. Are we just now going to lay down our arms and say, Sennacherib, we're sorry, and take whatever he gives us, knowing full well that whatever he gives will be terrible beyond description? Shall we fight? Or shall we seek to get help from somewhere else? To many people in Judah, to many of the princes especially, that would be to many of the political caste, the answer was obvious. As ever, Judah was lying between the two perennial centers of political and military power in the ancient world. To the north and east, there was Assyria then, Babylonia, then later Persia. Those were the powers from the north and the east. To the south, there was Egypt. Now many Jews saw their nation's role the way the British politicians throughout most of modern European history conceived Britain's role. And that was to hold the balance of power. When we were in school learning British history and European history, uh, maintaining the balance of power seemed to be just about the central plank in British foreign policy. It made a lot of sense. We couldn't allow France to get so strong that it dominated the continent. Her foe was usually Germany or Austria-Hungary, uh, the Germanic part of Europe. We couldn't afford to let them get so strong that they dominated the country uh, or the continent so that usually Britain's rule was hold the balance of power. Now that's how many Jews would have looked at their role. Don't let the Assyrians become too strong and to do that join up with Egypt. If Egypt gets too strong then transfer your alliance to somewhere else. In the case of Britain that made usually very good sense and it made uh, for a lot more peaceful Europe. Not that there was an awful lot of peace in Europe for most of its modern history. But it didn't make sense for Israel. It was a natural reaction. It seemed politically and militarily sound, but it was wrong. And it was wrong because Israel was not like any other nation on earth. 
And the logic that dictated the decisions of other nations had no place in the affairs of Israel. For one simple reason, and that was she was the Lord's covenant nation. To use the word of the New Testament in Stephen's great speech, she was God's church in the Old Testament period. He was her king. He was her protector. Right at the dawn of her national history, she had received from Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord's commandment against unholy alliances. In Exodus 23:32, the Lord spoke about the heathen nations around in general terms and said, Thou shalt make no covenant with them nor with their gods. And he even particularly mentioned the nation of Egypt. He had redeemed his people out of Egypt. And his command was, there would under no guise be a return to Egypt. In Deuteronomy 17 verse 16, he looked forward to the day when Israel would have a king. A time fulfilled, obviously, by the time Hezekiah came along. And he said, your king shall not multiply horses to himself. I should interject here that Egypt was famous for its horses. And uh, the nations round about got most of their supply from Egypt. You shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. That's the command. And the, he even goes further, say, you'll not return to Egypt to the end. He should multiply horses. You're not even to go there for this military purpose. Now, despite such warnings, Israel throughout its history continually entered into the very kinds of alliance that God had forbidden. Even Asa, one of Judah's godliest kings, even Asa, the man of God, the man who had proved the power of God when the Ethiopian hosts had uh, invaded his land, even Asa almost immediately after that turned to Syria for help against Assyria, leading Hanani the prophet to say, because thou hast relied in the king of Syria, and hast not relied in the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Now, in the days of Hezekiah, some in Judah were seeking an alliance with Egypt. Hence, the prophet's intervention, woe to them that go down into Egypt for help. Now, what was so sinful about making such an alliance? That's an important question. And if you don't get that right, you will not understand the application of this text to the Church of Christ in general. What was so wrong about going to Egypt for help? As I said, politically it made sense. Militarily it made sense. You would have to say on every score, if you were an economist, you would say, let's do this. This is what makes sense. Just parents looking at the welfare of their children and saying, here are these hosts of Assyrians coming to devastate our land and take our children into slavery. You would say, this makes sense. So what was so wrong about it? You've got to understand what wasn't wrong about it. I have heard people quote this text when they don't like uh, a Christian, for example, standing for public office. I remember when Dr. Paisley first uh, stood for public office or was going in that direction in Northern Ireland. I remember some young man who knew no better coming to me and piously quoting, uh, the scripture says you don't go down to Egypt for help. There's always been this isolationist streak in much of evangelicalism. 
The scriptures do not command the people of God to be isolated from the world. The scriptures do not command the people of God to withdraw from the affairs of their nation. That is an Anabaptist doctrine. Well, it was at least a doctrine of many Anabaptists at the Reformation period. There were other Anabaptists who sought to set up a republic and actually run the nation, the army and all. We'll not get into that one this morning. But that is not a Protestant, biblical perspective. The people of God are not called to isolate themselves from the world, from the nation, from the state, from the affairs of the world. What is being taught us here is that the children of Judah were turning from the spiritual means that God had provided for protecting and prospering His work, and they were substituting the methods of the flesh or the world. They were replacing faith in God with dependence on human ability. Now, the people of God must penetrate the world. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You will never be the salt if you try to be isolated. We are to penetrate the world. But the world is not to infiltrate the church. There is all the difference in the world in that. Now when you put the matter like that, you'll see that immediately this text addresses a very contemporary problem and has a very clear message for us. We have both views very, very rampant uh, in the church today. We still have some evangelicals, fundamentalists, and to an extent even some reformed people who want to isolate who want to say the state is rotten. We have no part in it. We withdraw completely. Now, all that is going to do is leave government in the hands of the ungodly. If you give government into the hands of the ungodly and do nothing about it, if you're willing to hand it all over to the wicked, then don't come crying when the wicked live up to their nature and they're totally wicked. For you can't expect anything else of them. But then the, on the other hand, there's the new evangelical notion. And they dress this up in such scholarly and flowery language. I was reading in Christianity Today, uh, well, that's the name of the magazine, Christianity Today. I wasn't reading it today. I would hit that magazine just to be called Christianity because it gets further and further from Bible Christianity with just about every issue. But in that magazine, they keep on talking about engaging the culture. My, that sounds so learned. We are not just preaching and giving out tracts and telling sinners they're on the road to hell and here's the way to get to heaven. We're not just doing that. We're engaging the culture. And by engaging the culture, that normally means that you have uh, rock music, you have whatever it is the world is into, and this is engaging the culture. What is happening there is that the world is infiltrating the church. Now, let's understand the church must, if you want to use the word penetrate or infiltrate the world, but it must make sure that the world doesn't infiltrate it. Here's the message. God demands of us that His work is done in His way. And He condemns the substitution of carnal methods for those that he has himself prescribed. 
He's talking here about unholy alliances. Unholy alliances or the sin of using carnal methods to do the work of God. And as you consider this whole thing, the overwhelming conviction that will come to our hearts is that these unholy alliances are a greater threat to the work of God than the dangers from which they're supposed to protect it. Now with that in mind, I want us to look at this text this morning and just note the lines of thought in it. Four things that will be brief and straight to the point. The text raises first a serious threat that we must consider. Judah was under threat. There was a debate going on, what shall we do, because the threat was real. It was imminent. Indeed, it had already begun. Sennacherib was on the move. The work of God was on the verge, humanly speaking, if, if man would have his way, it was on the verge of being wiped out. Remember, the northern kingdom was already gone. The southern kingdom now was on the verge of annihilation. The threat was real. This is something we have got to take note of as we sit comfortably in church every week. We can very easily lose sight of this in America today, that the work of God is under threat. The work of God across this nation is under constant attack from implacable enemies who have money, they have position, they have influence, and they have a game plan. They are working hard, and they're working night and day for one aim and object, and that is for the obliteration of Bible Christianity from the affairs of this nation. You understand this? At least I trust you do. We have uh, things that uh, turn our stomach sick that are not counted a threat to the nation. You can have hundreds of thousands of people congregate in New York under the banner of complete support for sodomy. Does that threaten America? No. That's no threat. That's the future of America, so we're told. You have seen the thin edge of the wedge out in Hawaii with the attempt to legalize sodomite marriage. Man, uh, we have seen that just turn back and no more. Now one state Supreme Court has stated that uh, sodomite liaisons are to be protected and to be given all the legal benefits of marriage. Is that a threat to America? No. But let a man stand for office and say he believes that book. Let a man stand for office and say America needs to return to the Word, to the law, and to the gospel of God. And suddenly America is in peril, so we are told. The threat according to those now in power is not Hollywood which has done more to corrupt this nation and to damn it than any other entity in the land. The threat is not the sodomite lobby. The threat is Bible Christianity. That's what we have got. And because of that, the time, the talent, and the resources of many people and movements of influence are dedicated to the obliteration 
of Christianity as a vital force in this nation. You can list the movements and the agencies. In general terms, you can speak of humanism. Secular humanism is now the state religion of America. This is not supposed to be a nation that has a state religion. This nation has a state religion. It is secular humanism. Atheism, secularism, don't limit it to them. You have Romanism, which at the end of the day, worldwide, will provide a threat to the work of God that many people who have never known the power of Rome unleashed will come to see when it's too late. You can see these forces at work in every arena of life. You can see it in government. You can see it in the press. You can see it in science. You can see it in education. But at the end of the day, you know, the truth is what it always was. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places or heavenly places. In other words, it's the age-old argument. It's the age-old fight. We face the same question as the Jews did in Hezekiah's day. What shall we do in the face of this opposition? It leads me to the second thought in the text which is the thought of a glorious provision this text as our Bible reading is based upon the belief that God has made adequate provision for his church the people of Judah should not go down to Egypt for help because there is help already available they should not turn away to carnal methods because there are spiritual methods already available. In other words, what the Lord is saying to Judah is this. There is a way of spiritual life and fellowship. There is a way of contact with the God of heaven that Sennacherib knows nothing about. There is power available to you through that fellowship that Sennacherib cannot begin either to understand or withstand. And if you will take what God has on offer to his people, Sennacherib will not obliterate the work of God. That's the message. There is a glorious provision. We read of it in verse 15 of chapter 30. Thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, we could put there in converting, in repenting, in rest, that is in trust, in faith. Are these not great terms? In repenting and in trusting, you shall be saved. In quiet confidence in your God, you shall be strong. That's the promise that God gave to Judah. Chapter 31, verse 1, he upbraids them for not looking unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seeking the Lord. So what he's saying is, here are the ways to protect and prosper the work of God. Now let's learn this. He's saying the way to protect and prosper the work of God does not lie in anything worldly. It lies at the door of the people of God. Now let's take this 
very personally this morning, this is true in your own individual life, the way to protect and prosper the work of God in your life, the way to protect and prosper the work of God in your family, the way to protect and prosper the work of God in this church, and then throughout this nation, starts with the people of God. God is saying, look, no matter what the enemy is doing, no matter what the world is planning, no matter what resources they bring to bear upon you, no matter how weak you may feel yourself to be, it is time to seek the Lord. Repent. Oh, is that not a word that needs to be preached, not just to sinners, but to saints? There is a great lack of the preaching of repentance. Most people who are invited to experience conversion to Christ are invited to a conversion without repentance. Come believe, and I believe in telling sinners to believe, but let me tell you, to believe is to repent. It's to turn away from sin, to turn unto Christ in faith. Not only are sinners being given a gospel without repentance, but Christians are being offered so often, in so many ways, a life that is as like the world as makes no difference, and there is little call to repentance in the church of God. And when it is mentioned, it is usually that we are being told to repent for not being politically correct. I'm not talking about repenting of the sin of political incorrectness. I'm talking about us repenting of the sins that have grieved away the Spirit of God from working with power in the midst of His people. If we have no power to live, if we have no power to serve, if we have no power to overcome, then it is because of our lack of the moving of the Spirit of God. What do we need? We need the Holy Ghost to come with power. Therefore, he says, repent. Repent. Repent and believe. Take the promise of God, take your stand upon it, believe it, and pray till the light breaks through. Seek the face of God. Look, look, look unto Him. Do you notice the message of the text is the very same message that Paul preached in Hebrews 12? How do you do this? You do it by looking unto the Lord. Some years ago in Britain, there was a children's choir formed from an amalgamation of Sunday schools. I don't know if you've ever worked with a lot of children to try and get them to sing. Well, some of the folk here have worked with our own little ones to get them to sing. And part of the, uh, the uh, beauty of that occasion is when kids don't do what they're supposed to do when one turns that way when he's supposed to be turning that way uh, when one walks away to his mommy when he's supposed to be singing when one doesn't sing at all when he's supposed to know all the words well, you, we've seen all that and that's part of the charm of children singing but this was not meant to be such an occasion this was an amalgamation of many Sunday schools into a great choir and the choir master got up he said something to those little ones that the Lord says to you and me. He said, I want you to watch me. Forget about all that's going on around there and watch me. Watch my hands. Watch my movements. If you take your eyes off me, you'll get it wrong. That's the message we all need to hear. 
Set your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. For as soon as we look away, we will get it wrong. And that's, that my friend, is the dangerous error that confronts the church of Christ. So that's the third thing in the text. This dangerous error that we can get our eyes off the Lord. We can somehow get along by our own strength, by our own methods, or go down to Egypt for help. But God's work can be done by other than God's means. He has said, I've given you an armor. Well, we say, we can get along without it. He has said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're saying, well, we can get along with carnal weapons. That's the error of this text. Historically, we can see this throughout the history of the Church of Christ. What was the link of early 4th century Christianity? What was the link of Christianity with the Emperor Constantine. Politically, it was a stroke of genius. Economically, it brought the church out of poverty into wealth. After 300 years of persecution, it was now the official religion. Heathen temples were converted into Christian churches. Heathens were being swept in great numbers out of heathenism into Christianity. Sadly, not into Christ in many cases. What was this conjunction of Christianity with Constantine and the Empire? It was going down to Egypt for help. And that was the basis upon which the mighty drift, and it didn't happen all at once, but the mighty drift, from pure Christianity to the darkness of medieval heathenism called Romanism. That's where it all started. Even the reformers were slow to see this. And I say that as an admirer of the reformers. And thank one who thanks God for their ministry. But too many of the reformers could not separate the church from the state, from the empire. Too many of the reformers were willing to call in the sword of state to back up the law of God, sometimes even against their brethren who confessed the same Savior. What was that? It was going down to Egypt for help. In more modern times, as science began to make its great attack on religion, as they called it, and especially as the experimental sciences took hold, and appear to have an answer for what previously had been thought to be supernatural. The church began to back off from the Bible. To say, well the Bible isn't meant to be taken as literally as Christians have taken it. Therefore they introduced literary criticism rationalistic criticism still giving us its death through kicks we have what was called the documentary hypothesis that broke this book of God up into a patchwork of human documents that were not inspired 
but were put together to look as if they were. Now here's the thing. The men who did this, we may say, were apostates, they were, they were deniers of the faith, and I would agree. But they were welcomed in the church because the rationale behind this was to rescue Christianity. We cannot face modern science with a literal Word of God. Therefore, we have got to reinterpret so that even though we lose the Bible, we retain Christianity. That was their thinking. What was it? It was going down to Egypt for help, and they lost not only their Bible, they lost their gospel, they lost their church, they lost their souls, they lost their families, they lost the nations. Because Egypt never does help. Egypt always is part of the problem, never part of the answer. You take it, when America was coming toward the end of the Second Great Awakening, remember something I said Wednesday night, this is the greatest the longest-running real revival in American history or in the history of almost any other nation. For almost 40 years, this nation knew constant movings of the Holy Ghost. This nation had preachers who knew God who knew the power of God, who knew the blessing of God, who knew what it was to preach in the old Puritan evangelism that had so shaken England and America. Then came the new measures of Charles G. Finney. In the words of one Methodist historian I read some years ago whose name now escapes me. He came along at a time when democracy was spreading. And he tapped into it to democratize the gospel. God has done all he can. He's waiting for your vote. In a word, that's the neism. What was it? It was going down to Egypt for help. It finished the revival and it cursed every place in America where Finney was supposed to have had revival. From that day to this, not one single place where Finney's new measures were practiced and where they had a Finney revival. From that day to this, not one single place has ever again known the blessing of God. That's a serious thought. It was going down to Egypt for help. Not only historically, Currently, the same error is causing untold harm. What is ecumenism? What is the drive for church union apart from union in the truth of the gospel? I am far from believing that God's people should be divided. I am far from believing that God's people uh, should be unwilling to come together because they disagree on certain points of doctrine or polity. I think that's a scandal that you have Christians fighting Christians over things that good and great and godly men have disagreed on throughout history. But the ecumenical movement is a movement for unity whether you believe in the finished work of Christ or not, whether you believe in justification by faith alone or not, whether you believe in such a thing as personal regeneration and saving faith in Christ or not, 
indeed uh, proved themselves willing to go so far whether you believe in the deity of Christ or not. You're supposed to believe that in the world of of churches, but their track record shows them accepting churches that have professedly become Unitarian. What is that? It's going down to Egypt for help. We must have numbers. We're going to affect the world. We have to have a world church. Even evangelicalism has fallen into the same trap. In the Church of England, the evangelicals faced a perennial problem. They were always a minority. Did they get out and take their stand for God outside? No, no, they didn't. So did any wit, wisdom, guts and grace, that's what they would have done, even if they wanted to remain Episcopalians. With their belief in apostolic succession at all, they could have carried it all with them. While I don't believe those things, I would certainly not fight with them about them if they'd been willing to take a stand for God. But no, no, they stayed inside. Sound in the faith, many of them. Many of you have read the writings of J.I. Packer and have been blessed by the writings of Dr. Packer, a great theologian and also a great compromiser. You may have read some of the writings of J.R. Stott, another excellent theologian, brilliant writer, but a down-the-line compromiser. In the middle 1960s, the evangelicals got together to plot a new course in the Church of England. And what was it? It was a course to embrace unbelief. Not that they were going to become unbelievers, but that they were deliberately going to yoke themselves with those they knew rejected the very gospel that they were preaching in order to increase their influence in the church to get more evangelical bishops. We've had a couple of so-called evangelical archbishops of Canterbury. They have been worst of all. To get into the universities, to get seats of learning, to have evangelicals in the chairs of the great universities. And now some of those men have come and they've said, in order to maintain these places, we have had to betray the very evangelicalism that we thought we were defending. You see, the whole idea is, we need numbers. Where does God ever say we need numbers to do anything great for God? Where did he ever say that? He told Gideon, you have too many. You have 32,000 people. I can't work with them. Too many. So 22,000 went home. 10,000 soldiers to fight. A mighty army. It seemed like ridiculous. But God said, you've still got too many. There'll come a day when they can all serve, but not today. I'm going to use 300 men. Now God doesn't always do that. But I'm simply making the point, where does God say we need to have great numbers before we can see anything done. We need God, not numbers. We need the Holy Ghost, not just numbers. Now, if we have 10,000 people filled with the Holy Ghost, hallelujah! But it's the Holy Ghost power that we need. Scripture says, could two walk together except they be agreed? The ecumenical movement says, oh yes, we can get along. The new evangelicals say, oh yes, we can get along. What is it that's going down to Egypt for help? Look at how entertainment as a way of appealing to sinners has taken over the modern evangelical and fundamental church even. Just look at it. Churches 
are now, for a large part of their ministry, entertainment centers. The idea is, we've got to be able to appeal to sinners. You see, once you get away from the old Calvinistic doctrine of the depravity of man, that he's dead in trespasses and sin, and that it takes a miracle of the Holy Ghost to regenerate that man in order to enable him to believe in Jesus Christ, once you get away from that doctrine, then you're down to saying God has done his part, now it's up to us and the sinner to do our parts, and we've got to make the gospel appealing to sinners. I'm all in favor of preaching the gospel in language that sinners understand. But you've got to bring in rock music. That's how you appeal to sinners. And all the gimmickry of Hollywood and all the blitz of Nashville were appealing to sinners. We, we get them in for a rock concert. And in the midst of all the hysteria, we feed them enough gospel or bits of the gospel to make an appeal and they'll walk up the aisle. My, what glorious things are happening. No, 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 there's nothing glorious about it. It's going down to Egypt for help. Same thing true in evangelism. I got a little book this week about Puritan evangelism. Very, very good little booklet. How did the Puritans evangelize? And they evangelized with great effect. There was always an emphasis on the doctrine of the gospel. But we're told nowadays, people won't listen to doctrine. Even Christians won't listen to doctrine. So why preach doctrine? Well, I want to tell you something. If you don't preach doctrine, you're not preaching the gospel. If you're not preaching doctrine, you're not preaching Christ. I am tired listening to the hackneyed old lie. It's not a doctrine people need. It's a person. Well, sure, it's a person. But who is this person? That's the question. Who is this person, Jesus Christ? And once you answer that question, you're preaching doctrine. What did he do? Once you answer that question, you're preaching doctrine. But nowadays, no, no, we don't want any doctrine. In fact, we don't want much preaching. You remember the large Texas church that has a great shopping mall it has a beauty shop for the women it has a bowling alley it has, you name it, it has it all I don't know if it's quite as big as Haywood Mall but when I saw the television documentary on it, it looked as big that might have been overstatement but it, it was enormous thousands and thousands of people in membership and the unsaved, ungodly interviewer was asking these people, well, it's a great place. You come for your beauty treatment. You come for your bowls. You come for your restaurants. You, have a whole lot of, you can choose your restaurants. You've got it all here. Yeah, this is the whole experience, man. This is the whole, this is the whole life. This is wonderful. Uh, what about church? Oh, what about it? It's his church. Well, what about preaching? Oh, well, you know, we're not big into preaching around here. That was the answer. We're not big into preaching around here. Preaching minimized. It's methods that count. Even in fundamental churches, the big question is, what new method, what new way can we go? Listen, my friend, I want to tell you, when we get to this stage, what we're doing is simply taking the methods of mind control, mind manipulation, humanism with a Bible text. That's what we've come to. Do you ever notice in most of what passes is preaching nowadays? God is there for the happiness of man. And that's all. 
You want your life right? You want your life patched up? You want your anxieties taken care of? You want this? You want that? Then try Jesus. But the old gospel of a sinner convicted by the view of the holiness and the justice of God, a sinner brought to repentance and faith and salvation for the everlasting glory of God. Almost unheard of. Evangelism has gone down to Egypt for help. Oh, it has manufactured and multiplied decisions by the million. Never let that fool you. Matthew 7 is a passage that scares the life out of me. I read it with trembling and with fear. Jesus said, not some, not a few, not quite a few, but many, many multitudes. How many? I don't know. But when Jesus is talking about the great end of the age and the judgment and he's talking about many I believe he's talking about millions it's not a handful many shall say to me in that day Lord, Lord have we not preached in your name have we not cast out devils in your name have we not done wonderful works in your name I will profess to them I never knew you now let me say something. You know the only people who worry about that text? The only people who worry about it are the people who have nothing to worry about. The only people I have ever seen worried about that text are people who genuinely are trusting Christ and nobody else to save them and who genuinely want to serve the Lord Jesus. But those who are quite happy to an unregenerate life and a worldly affiliation and say, but I walked the aisle, I signed the card, I got baptized, I joined the church. They never turn a hair. But don't be fooled by the millions of decisions. For I believe tragically that the most of them mean nothing, nothing good. In Christian experience, what is happening? And this is where so many Christians, even around Greenville, I have come across so many Christians whose lives are in bondage. Why? Some of you remember well that you've come to the end of yourselves. There's bound to be something in Christianity that I have never found. I've trusted Christ and yet I'm living in utter and total bondage. Guilt manipulation from the pulpit. Preachers getting you to do what they want you to do by making you feel guilty if you don't do it. Psychological gimmicks. Little bits of Freudianism with a, a Bible text added to tell you this is a principle and that's a principle and that's a principle. And if you live by these principles you'll be alright and you've tried it and it doesn't work. What is that? It's going down to Egypt for help. Let me kneel my colors to the mast today. It's not dressed up Freud or Carl Rogers or Young or any other uh, worldly psychology that we need. It is the old theology of the Bible that we need and nothing else. But God's people are tied up in knots. Because their preachers are going down to Egypt for help. You know what the idea in evangelism is? Do you know what the idea in these Christian living seminars is? The old ways don't work anymore. We need something new. I want to tell you, it's not new methods we need. It's a man with a new experience of God. I never forget what my late friend Jordan Kahn said. When people told him praying doesn't work the same as it used to. The power of Pentecost. And he wasn't talking about this Pentecostal. So what's the difference between Pentecostal and Pentecost? 
He wasn't talking about charismatic gibberish pretending that it's the gift of foreign languages that they had in Acts chapter 2. No, no. But when he met people who said Pentecost is not for today, you've got to see Khan, but this height, dark, dark, burning, almost black eyes. A man who spent eight hours out of every 24 on his knees in prayer, and when you met him and prayed with him, you knew it. Broke your heart to pray with that man. But he would look at them with the eyes almost hardly smoldering, almost with flame coming out of them, and he would say, Have you spent ten days as the early church did? Waiting on God. Do you know what it is to lay as they did? To lay aside all and take the promise of Acts 1, 4 and 5 and wait for 10 days and pray through. When you have done that and God doesn't answer, then you can tell me Pentecost is not for today. But don't come telling me it's not for today when God has given you the means and you won't take them. Do you know what the trouble today is? Jeremiah 2.13 My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no waters. That's the trouble with going down to Egypt for help. And it is trouble, for God says, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man that maketh flesh, his arm whose heart has departed from the Lord here's the error my time is gone but I can't finish on a negative note I've got to say this text gives you a blessed assurance and the assurance that the old biblical methods do work, God is still on the throne God is still evil he's doing his work and he's willing to bless his people. Amos 5 verse 4, Thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Second Chronicles seven fourteen is still in the book. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land. And by the way, that land is not America. That land is not Britain. That land is not Northern Ireland. That was the land of Israel. We are the Israel of God in the New Testament and the land is the church. We will have an effect upon America and Britain and Ireland. But the land that God is promising to revive is His church. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Now you say, now you're getting to Does money have anything to do with this? You bet it does. You better be sure it does. God doesn't need your money, but you need to tithe, and so do I. Bring all the tithes. Well, can we buy revival? No, you can give your tithes and still not get through to God. For God's not just looking for your purse. God's looking for your heart. Give me your heart. But he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And prove me now. Hear with, saith the Lord, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there shall not be room enough to receive it. Here's the blessed assurance. God's ways still work. Instead of going down to Egypt for help, let's go up to heaven for help. For our help is in the Lord's great name, who heaven and earth by his great power did free it.